This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. Hope you've enjoyed some of the other episodes I've been putting out on Kickstarter, how to raise money on Indiegogo, equity crowdfunding, all that kind of stuff we talk about on this show. And I hope that as you're going into your upcoming campaign, you feel more confident having listened to some of these successful entrepreneurs that I've been talking with. You've also have some strategies that you can apply to make yourself more successful going into your campaign. And also, you know what to avoid, the, the pitfalls, the common things um, that really can eat into your margins. The, the really bad mistakes that can actually make you end up owing money. That's what I really love to talk about on this show is just preparing you for success. And education is something that I am super passionate about. You know, it's one of the reasons why I've been doing this for the last six years. Um, usually every single week, I'll put out a weekly newsletter where basically I share some of my best content, some of my new articles that I've written, um, some of the new YouTube videos I'm putting out, like all that kind of new stuff. And if you're interested, you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter, which I called killer crowdfunding tips um, all you have to do is go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe enter your email address there and i'll start sending you this weekly newsletter it's also just kind of like a a way to to get an update really quick like bite-sized on the stuff that's happening in my life um you know i'm not only just talking about crowdfunding here in education but this is a journey that we're taking here together you know my goal is to sort of hold your hand every step of the way as you're going up and gearing up towards this launch but i also think that business is about more than just raising money and about marketing and traffic it's also about the life that we build for ourselves and that's kind of what i want you to listen to in today's show because the entrepreneur that I had on today. He started off with a, a normal nine to five job. Um, and then he tried to get a job in you know a small business, but that business ended up going under. A lot of the times we assign security that to larger companies or small businesses. And what we don't realize is actually there isn't a lot of security, particularly nowadays. So he decided to go out on his own and start his own company. And five years ago, he made this choice, made this decision in his life. And it's led to a lot of great things. Um, he's launched over 30, launched 13 uh, kick starter campaigns he's done a bunch of other board games available on his website and he's learned a ton of information a lot of stuff and lessons that he wants to share with you today so you're going to hear about um, communication you're going to learn about how he's actually able to to pull this off advice that he has for you things that you should be aware of and mistakes that he made with shipping all this kind of stuff you're going to hear from him today so i think we can really take some of these lessons to heart but also just the i think to me um the idea that such a a small decision can radically change your life a decision to to go all in on your business a decision to make something important even just a decision to hey you know what i'm really interested in maybe music or i'm really interested in publishing i'm going to spend you know 10 hours of my week and I'm going to try and make a next novel. I'm going to try and make a board game and just try it. I think that every time that you try something new, you always discover something that you're good at. And maybe in my case, something that you're, you're not so good at. Um, so that's also like another really key lesson here today. But finally, that link, if you want to check it out, it's uh, crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Enter your email address and you'll get little tidbits like this from me um, every single week. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Man, 
we have another incredible Kickstarter success story. This entrepreneur has raised money many times on Kickstarter. Looking here, they've created over they've created over ten games, um, thirteen different games, different board games, um, different things that they've raised money for. The most recent game, One Night Ultimate Super Villains, they've raised over a hundred thousand dollars for more than one thousand seven hundred backers. I think we're really lucky um, to have the entrepreneur today on the podcast, Ted, um, who's the founder of this company. Looking forward to talking to you. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be here. Where are you hailing in from? Where around the country? Uh, we're just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. Very cool. Um, you know, I was talking in the intro, the, the different games that you've created. I wonder if you could just tell the listeners when you actually started launching these games on Kickstarter. And also, did you have a company before that? Was like this your first foray into business? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we found the company was founded back in 2006. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, I had a regular full time job and I was designing games and pretty much publishing my own designs and some expansions for some other games and doing that you know, directly, you know, having very small uh, print runs, you know, 2000, 3000 copies at the, at the very most. Mm. And uh, in 20, well, let's see here, 2011, probably um, I ended up doing a, a probably the first game Kickstarters that I had done. I guess the first one was for a game called Mutant Meeples, um, which was a, it's a board game, very similar to Ricochet Robots, that sort of thing. And uh, that did okay. It was like 15,000 at the time. That was awesome. I was thrilled by that. Um, and that's that's certainly, it, it met its goal. It exceeded its goal. I think the goal was 10,000 and I exceeded it. And I was thrilled because it was the first large board game, the actual, you know, in a, kind of the big size, the ticket to ride size box, about 12 by 12 by three. Uh, that you see on shelves. And those are very, very expensive to produce. And like I said, you know, I'm doing this part time. So I didn't really have a lot of cash to put into the production of a board game. So Kickstarter was a great option for going in that direction, being able to, you know, help me out with producing something that large. And uh, so, you know, that was successful. And, uh, you know, after that, um, we started putting some more games on there and kind of uh, changing a little bit. You know, we used Kickstarter again initially for making sure that we could fund uh, our projects. And that's kind of morphed over time into something in a, a way for us to be able to provide a lot of um, specialty items for our fans and people who like our games. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's we've been really fortunate. We've had a couple um, really successful Kickstarters and some successful products. And um, I mean, look, just looking here, like the ultimate werewolf deluxe edition, that was really looked like your breakout initial success. You're like, you had over 2000 backers pledged more than over 130 K for that game. Yeah. Um, and that's really, that was a really big, you know, jump up from, from what the initial campaigns you were launching here. It kind of looks like you Absolutely. were learning from what you were doing. Oh yeah. And I, I was certainly learning and in hindsight, there's so many things I did wrong on that campaign. Um, things that were both wrong from, I, I could have done better, I think. And also, uh, I cost myself a lot of money by making some changes mid campaign, uh, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the biggest issue, which uh, you know, it's a everyone who does things in Kickstarter the first couple times they learn things, and hopefully it's not they're not horrible horrible lessons like you see sometimes. But uh, this one was, uh, I was so excited that you know the, it was doing so well that I decided to increase the size of the box, and uh, that by itself is not that big of a deal, except that um, I had predicated the shipping cost on, at least for U.S. shipping, domestic shipping, on kind of these small flat rate boxes Ooh. And, and inside there. And so that was like, you know, at the time it was like 425 or 450 or something. And uh, it did not fit in there. And it was heavier because I kept on adding all these cards because we kept on making all these stretch goals. And so the, the difference was it was like, I think eleven dollars to ship a copy instead of five. Wow, uh, that's, or you can't that's change a big that jump. The campaign. I mean, you're you're pretty much stuck. And of course, I did not realize that until after the campaign was over, and it hit me like, oh no, what have I done? Um, but you know, it, it was it's fine. It's a learning it, lesson. It didn't, it didn't break me. It still still is a very profitable campaign. Uh, but it was one of those things that um, definitely got me much more like I need to be more prepared ahead of time that in case the Kickstarter is more successful than I originally anticipate, not to dive into something without having done the research totally. in terms of the cost, the shipping costs, and all the other related uh, aspects of it. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned um, sort of starting off on this journey, I guess, um, doing this part-time because this is something that you love to do. Is this something that you do full-time now? I know you've put out a lot of different games since that beginning um, trek, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So myself and my wife, uh, we uh, have uh, took our company, kind of incorporated it about, let's see, it's 20, about almost five years ago now. And um, so we've been doing this full time for a little over five years. 
And, uh, you know, we now have uh, five employees, five full-time employees. We've got um, you know, some part-time employees and some contractors. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool. It's, 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 it's awesome to be able to have the, to be able to provide jobs for people in the board game industry. That's really neat. Um, it's great to be able to do this full time. Um, I, I liked my previous job, but I love my current job. So this is, you know, what, kind what, of a, a perfect thing. Love board games, uh, love designing and love publishing them, love talking about them. So yeah, uh, definitely. Very, very um, happy I think it's really, it's very rare. And it's also one of those things to be able to do what you love and to be able to do it full time and also give that opportunity to other people. That's just, that's, I imagine, an incredible feeling. But what was it like initially when you were making that decision? Because to, to do, to start an entirely new board game company from scratch and, and to do that and make that leap, I imagine that was a very difficult conversation, maybe with your wife or maybe just yeah, internally. You know, it's funny. The, uh, it, it happened much more organically than that. You know, you think, uh, I think a lot of people are like, hey, wow, well, you decided just to quit your job and start a board game company. Oh, for us, it was, you know, we both had full-time jobs and uh, we were just doing the board game thing on the side um, for a little bit. And, you know, we're still going to conventions. We'd go to Essen or Gen Con or whatever to sell games, promote them. Um, And then we sell things directly. And we had a few distributors for some of our more popular titles. But it really didn't take off until about uh, 2012, 2013 is when it really started to get to steam. a, a steamroll and, and it, uh, enabled us to basically not have to have another job and to be able to do this full time. So, um, you know, it, it was a very slow process. We are in general, like pretty risk averse. Um, you know, we're, I'm very proud to say we've never had to take a loan out for the business. Um, uh, everything we've done, we've kind of, um, you know, earned whatever money we can. We put that yeah. money into our next project, et cetera. And, um, you know, so, you know, we didn't start in debt. We didn't, uh, we're not in debt now. And that's, that's a really cool, um, thing and uh, one of the things that I'm super excited that we've never had that situation or had to you know be, be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So um, emotionally, like, how, how did that feel actually though taking that leap? Like, w- did I mean you mentioned having this track run of success? Did it feel that uncertainty? Just kind of feel like it was like organically just the right time? Like, I, I don't know. I just want to get a sense of like if you yeah. always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like this was in the this was in the cards oh. for you. You know, I think. Deep down inside, yes, I always did. I had a, a very a strange thing that happened to me um, when I when I was in college. I had an internship with with a company, and they offered me a job right, um, you know, while you know while I was there for when I graduated. And so I thought this is great, and this is this is back way way back in the in the early nineties, and uh, so this is great. A week before I graduated, that company went bankrupt. Um, it was a very small company, and uh, it was a super nice guy. He was trying to do all the right things, but he just got in over his head and he couldn't get out. And of course, he went bankrupt, so I had no longer had a job right after you know uh, college. And it really hit home the basically the idea of being financially responsible and to really pay attention. You know, when you're starting a business, that you know a lot of companies, a lot of banks are going to offer you loans, and a lot of things you're going to be able to do to get started. Um, but um, you know, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, I kept that with me as I was uh, doing a lot of other things, you know, and having uh, different occupations through the years. And I think by the time we started this company, um, we were, like I said, you know, very conservative about what we were doing. And those first print runs, you know, they were they were basically what we could afford. And, you know, the, the idea was that, you know, what, if it's bond, if a game bond didn't sell at all, we weren't, you know, we we're going to have to take a mortgage on the house or we weren't going to be in a lot of trouble or have to quit the business entirely. We just move on to something else and maybe do a little smaller next time. Mm. And, uh, That's a different way to think about it, definitely, that, that mindset. Because you know you think of like an established company, even a small business, and you think that they're really secure and it's a good decision. But then they, they end up going out of business, right, when you're getting a job. It really changes yeah. your perspective, I can imagine. Yeah, there. yeah. so I think, I think that, that's, that's what probably did that for me. And, I've, and I think overall, it's probably a good thing because I, I think I would have probably made some bad decisions <laughs> uh, because – you know, as a as a board game designer and publisher, you love the stuff you publish. You wouldn't I, we wouldn't do this if we didn't love it because it is a lot of work. And you know, is the, the number of hours any designer or publisher spends on their games. Most most people who aren't in that business don't realize that it's just an immense amount of time. If we got paid hourly for what we did, it would not it would be minimum wage or less for most mm. people. Um, it's just it's not good. Uh, but you see, so you really love your, what you're doing, and you have this this faith in these these creations you've created, and you expect them to do well because. Um, you know, you have spent all this effort on them and you, you think they're going to do really well and you, you've gotten really good feedback. And, you know, certainly early on, I didn't know how to get really good feedback on a lot of those games. And so while I was getting good feedback, it was kind of, you know, a, a little bit of an echo chamber sort of thing where I was kind of 
hearing what I wanted to hear and, uh, you know, not, it's difficult. Not, not asking the hard questions that I'm asking now and that I have been asking for the last five or six years since we've been a little more successful. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's one of those things that you learn over time. But again, it was fortunate that we didn't have a lot of money that outlaid, you know, because yeah. if I had the ability, as someone, you know, said that, and I wasn't concerned about that, you know, putting 40, 50, $60,000 into a board game that I felt was going to be a, a good seller might have happened. And if it wasn't, then you could be out a good chunk of that money, a large percentage of that money. And, you know, that can be pretty devastating unless totally. you have yeah. a lot of cash reserves and most I think. I think, you know, what you said there too, getting feedback, that's something I want to ask you about in a little bit, because I think as a creative type, as someone who's creating art, but that also is meant for entertainment purposes, that's also meant for business purposes, it's really hard to get feedback. So I do want to ask you about that in a second. But before we do, can we just give the listeners a bit of an idea of like the theme, the recurring themes that you have in these different games that you've created? Um, how would you describe that, like the types of games that you're putting out just so that they know um, when they're checking out your different projects? Sure. Certainly the, the Kickstarter games we've done, the majority of them have been in the area of what's called social deduction. So most people are familiar with Werewolf, um, you know, and you mentioned before Ultimate Werewolf was a very successful uh, title of ours. And, uh, you know, our one night series is One Night Ultimate Werewolf and a bunch of series like that. The game that just finished on Kickstarter was One Night Ultimate Supervillains. Uh, they're social deduction games. They're, they're just very... Uh, engaging for people um, in terms of the social atmosphere. You're talking a lot with other players. You're you're um, bluffing in line and trying to convince them of something that's really not the case. And in many cases, other times you're trying to figure out what's going on. And there's a lot of interaction between people in in these games. And uh, you know they tend to support a lot of players. Um, the the Ultimate Werewolf game that did really well that supported I think at the time I think it says 75 players on the box. It's a little ridiculous, but you could theoretically play with that many people mm. uh, at one time. Uh, the one night games tend to support uh, ten people. Um, mm, okay. Use those games uh, that high or down to three people. So um, kind of nice because then that that makes its own little analog viral situation where one person brings the game, ten people play. If as long as one other pe- person is you know likes the game enough, they may go get a copy. And so it's it's a nice way to be able to you know spread that, which you don't really have in a traditional st- uh, strategy game that only plays maybe three or four people. So it's fast to play. It's easy to learn. Really great cartoons and illustrations. Um, also something you can play with friends, get conversation going. I can I can definitely see where, where the appeal is coming from for that type of game. Um, yeah. And I think also, you know, board games, you think of it, it's almost like bringing people together. Like, obviously, you love to play and you love to have, like, these kind of stories or you have, like, you know, bluffing and all those kind of fun stuff. But it's really about you and your friends. It's about having a good time together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's also a way to meet new friends. It's a way. It's also a way for gamers to be able to get people who typically aren't, who don't want to play games. They don't want to learn about rules to play games with them and to actually do an activity that, you know, maybe you really love that your spouse or the rest of your family isn't as enamored with as you are. Yeah. These are the sorts of games that you can actually play with them. And, uh, you know, we know, you know, we can watch the stats. Some of our games have apps and, uh, you know, we can track when people are actually using our apps, our, our apps. And it's kind of neat that the, the most popular day for our apps is Christmas day. Um, people play with their families on Christmas Day. The second most popular day is Black Friday, uh, then Thanksgiving and then New Year's Day and then Halloween, you know, things like that. So it's people getting together with their families and friends and they're they're playing our games, which is just that's just awesome. It's it's really nice that, you know, we're helping facilitate that sort of thing. So people aren't just there you know, hopefully not yelling at each other about politics yeah. or something else. <laughs> it's they're a, having a lot of fun playing a game. Yeah. And they're yeah. yelling at each other because you know, someone's lying about something in the game or something. And it's, it's a fun sort of engaging thing. And, uh, you can yeah. also like geekify your friends and get them into what, what you're into. So totally. yeah. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at the gadget flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month. They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. 
So I, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, some of the stuff that you've learned from, from doing these different projects, because you've obviously you have a wealth of experience here. Um, you've tried a lot of different things. You, even as you said, you've learned a lot along the way. Um, one of the things that it seems like you learned was in terms of the communication, whether that's updating people, um, communicating with backers, getting real feedback. Can you talk a little bit about that for the listeners? Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. And I think for any creator out there, there is this weird little situation with, with uh, communicating with backers. On the one hand, a lot of backers love the communication. They love that you're engaged and you're doing, you know, you're, you're updating them on what's happening with the project. Even if nothing's happening in the project, the fact that you tell them, hey, nothing's happening in the project, just wanted to let you know. Well, as soon as something is, we'll give you more updates. They really like that. Um, the bad part of that, though, unfortunately, uh, statistically, when you look at a lot of uh, campaigns, um, you can actually track that uh, as soon as you put an update out there, you get people who cancel their pledges. Um, they're like, oh, yeah, I did that. You know what? I don't think I want to use my money for that right now. I'm going to maybe turn something else I'm going to cancel. Uh, whereas if you hadn't put that update out there, they would have kept. They would have continued to back the game. Now, of course, we don't want anyone back in the game who doesn't want to get the game in the end. You know, mm. that's not trying to scam people into that. But at the same time, um, you, we certainly don't want to update people at the point where they're going, you know, do I really need this? Keep me thinking about it. No, nah, maybe I don't now. Um, interesting. That, so, uh, that's, that's this little push and pull between, between the two. And as much as I've seen those statistics and I, you know, I experience it myself, you can, when I put an update out there for our backers, I can look and Kickstarter has the dashboard that lets you see kind of in real time what's happening. You get cancellations, you get cancellations right away. It doesn't matter if the, even if the update says, that's awesome. Look at you guys. We're going to add a bunch of stretch goals. We're adding a bunch of bonuses. Everyone's getting more stuff. People still cancel. You get more cancellations right after updates than you do at any other time in your campaign. And that's and actually that, not talked about a lot. So what would you say would be like the sweet spot here in terms of the frequency where you want to keep people in the loop, but you don't want to sort of span them or make them be like, oh, why am I back in this campaign? Do I really need this thing? What would you say the yeah. sweet spot is? So we tried a bunch of different things. I've gone back and forth. And this particular, this last campaign we did, um, we, we had a whole entirely different strategy, which was we did a, um, a, a bunch of very achievable stretch goals, stretch goals that I thought we could be achieved within the first week, probably the campaign, if it went like our other campaigns that were similar. And then after that, we weren't going to do anything so that people would go, wow, this is great. I'm guaranteed to get these things. I don't have to, to worry about this. And then we also said that, you know, because we don't have that many stretch goals, we're not going to be pestering you with updates. And we don't feel necessarily pestering, but at the same time, some people feel that. And again, at the same time, we don't want to have people just drop off the campaign randomly because we're sending out a note that says, hey, we don't really have anything to tell you, but we'll let you know when we do. That's no good. Uh, so we put out fewer updates, and the people who are normally very engaged with that sort of thing, they, they were kind of upset about that, that uh, that we did not keep that level of engagement up. And mm. they were vocal, much more vocal than the people who, of course, people who cancel aren't vocal at all. They just drop out. But uh, very few people complain about too many updates, um, you know, that they're, they're, they're getting spammed. And of course, Kickstarter has the ability that you could just turn off uh, updates from any project that if you think you're getting too much um, stuff from people, you know, I've done mm. that. Like, okay, this is nice. I'm glad that, you know, you're, you're showing me every single piece of art that's being created, but I don't want yeah. that. So for, for you, for your Lots. particular type of game and your category, would you suggest people doing like once a week, twice a week? Um, do you even just not think of it that way? would love to hear about yeah, that. You know, it, it's, yeah, I think scheduling it um, like that can be a problem. I like, I'd rather schedule it as to, you know, that got some good information to share or something interesting. Certainly the first couple of days are critical and then you're going to, you want to do a lot of updates. You know, I'd definitely like to, to do an update either when the project is funded or we've reached our first stretch goal or something along those lines, because that's information that I think backers care about. They're like, oh, that's great. Good. We're funded. Uh, I can kind of just kind of forget about this. No, I'm going to get the project when it's, you know, said it's going to be shipping or when, when stretch goals get unlocked. They're like, that's cool. That's, you know, kind of like extra presence that they're getting. Um, and that's I, I think th those are good updates to have. It's the weird spot in between there where, you know, uh, anyway, again, Involved in a Kickstarter campaign, there's a lull. You know, you do a 30 day campaign, there's a weird the slump. Lull. The Kickstarter it's slump. Yeah. Eight and 25. It, it's, it's not moving along as much. Some are different. Some just, you know, go crazy the whole way through. But for the most part, that's that's what, you know, when we track it, that's where we see it. Just it's, you know, it's steady, but it, it's pretty slow. And uh, not a lot is happening in terms of more backers or a higher um, revenue amount. And stretch goals are coming out a little slower. Um, at the same time, 
uh, you can't go entirely silent. And I think the you know if you go more than a week without something in the middle of the campaign, that that makes backers very concerned. I think some backers would drop just because they're like, wow, I don't know what's going on here. That these these guys aren't communicating at all. So yeah, well uh, said, well I said. We certainly heard that sort of sentiment with this Kickstarter, where we tried to keep it as you know as little communication as possible, just that you know and kind of front load a lot of those stretch goals. And uh, a lot of backers didn't like that. And uh, we hadn't tried that before. And my thought was they were going to do exactly what they did. But I thought, well, try it and see, um, you know, uh, what, you know, what it is. Because anyone who runs a campaign, again, it's a lot of effort keeping up with that. And uh, so we said, let's just put it to the side, kind of see what happens there. But, yeah, you need to be engaged minimum once a week, I think, for updates. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that probably twice a week is probably a better, better number in general. But again, you don't want to put an update out there just to say, hey, I don't have anything to tell you, but it's an update. You can always find something, something about your project. You've talked to a supplier. You've, um, you know, you've got a, Had new a mini win, things. something, some celebration. I mean, you're, you're going yeah. a mile a minute here. Like your brain works so much faster than mine does. Um, I want to ask you, like backtrack a little bit because you're talking about stretch goals. And um, I know that's like really, you know, uh, for someone who's done a lot of different projects, that's like obvious. That's something that you do. That's some way to incentivize people. But for the beginners out there in the audience, can you tell them a little bit about what you've learned when it comes to stretch goals, the importance of those? Um, any advice you have on should you announce it at the beginning? Should you announce it in the middle? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think for us, um, we found that the most effective stretch goals are the are uh, they both. Uh, are, are um, achieved throughout this, the campaign. They're, they're structured in a way, um, you know, when you do your first Kickstarter, you really have no idea how well it's going to do. And it's kind of hard to anticipate that. You don't want to set them too high. Uh, if you put, you know, three stretch goals and they, they first start at $100,000 and you've never done a Kickstarter before, um, that's, you are going to be very lucky if you make that on that first one. That's, um, that's very ambitious. Yeah. Upset, they're like, oh, we're never going to make the stretch goal because you're, yeah, you're going to fund it 10,000 or whatever you set it to, but that stretch goal, we're not going to get that stuff. And that's kind of sad. And they, they may not appreciate that. And people coming to the, the thing, they kind of get a feel for, for that. So I think they need to be, you know, much more accessible. I, I love the idea of being able to lock at least one stretch goal on launch day. Um, so, you know, very close to, if not at funding level, that there's a stretch goal, you know, right after that, you know, like a thousand dollars more and you get a stretch goal or 5,000 more if you think it's going to do well or whatever. Um, and then have them kind of spaced out after that. Um, went a little crazy. You're saying the first one we had that was very successful. We did do stretch goals and we did. I think it was like, I don't, I don't remember what they were, but it was like every, maybe 2000 or $5,000. It was very, very really? fast. And, wow. But there's a whole list. I'm just scrolling through it right now. Uh, it was. It seems like at the time it was probably a full time job for me just to update the page. Interesting. Uh, to say that stuff was unlocked because uh, wow, um, it's like you know individual cards and a bunch of things and um, wow. But because um, usually I think yeah. of stretch goals, I think of like one major goal or something. But you almost did this really like scientifically, like sort of nudging people along, creating that momentum. Yeah, and I, I like the idea that you achieve a stretch goal and then either then or close to then another stretch goal further up is revealed. So you have two or three stretch goals that are kind of people are aware of. Um, and so they're, they're looking to get those stretch goals. And they also know that that, that uh, thing that if they get one of those stretch goals and as soon as they get to a certain level, we're going to see more potential stretch goals in the future. It's kind, and of, like that's kind of exciting. Yeah. yeah. And, and that really keeps people engaged, I think, because there's, there's more things that pop up that are interesting and new. Um, you know, and again, uh, as I said, there's always the caveat as a creator, you never want to do things that you haven't checked into or tested first. Um, you know, I'm just looking here on my on my Ultimate Werewolf one where I made that that mistake. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, when did I choose to do a bigger box? And you know what? I don't think it was even a stretch goal. I think it was one of the things I said. You know what? We're just going to give you guys a bigger box uh, <laughs> and because I'm like, well, we can do this. You know, it's it's a bigger box. It I knew a, a, printing a slightly larger box is not very expensive. Um, but the shipping part, I just did not take into consideration. And uh, totally. Whoops. So uh, yeah, I also I, I really like I like the idea of planning the whole thing ahead of time. Um, you know, planning the the entire stretch goals that you you can ship for the amount that your backers are backing for and their shipping costs. Make sure that that's all included there. And then once the campaign starts, you should have a feel for kind of where you're going to be going. You know, you never predict exactly, and things can always change. And you know, you can always get the the magical bonus of someone at Kickstarter saying they they like your thing. So once it's liked by that, that's 
that's yeah. free money for the most part because now it appears on a lot more of the searches when people go to Kickstarter. Um, those things are kind of random and you can't expect them. Uh, but you'll have a rough idea at least about how to space them out so that um, you can get most of those stretch goals in place. I um, urge you guys to like go and check out the way that this company does their structuring of stretch goals, the way that they lay out their campaigns. It's um, B-E-Z-I-E-R Games. Just type that into Kickstarter. A um, lot of interesting, really cool products. Um, and, and just the way that you have announced them. And I also think the way that you structure it, it's almost like you're gamifying the entire experience. You know, It's like the entire experience of Kickstarter and backing is like a game and like you're unlocking these different cool levels and stuff. You know, yeah. so it's it's a, it's a neat feel to that. I'm speaking to the crowd funders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign. We have actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets. It's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. I think one of the other things when it comes to running a Kickstarter campaign is really having a team around you of people that are incentivized. I think one of the hard parts of it also is when you have a tribe or you have some people who have already backed it, getting them to share that with their friends, with their family, with you know other people that might be interested in board games. And I know one of the ways you did that was with um, incentivizing like this this referral program system. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about how you were able to do that? Yeah, there's a there's a new system uh, that's that's um, just it's in beta still called kickrock.it, and um, it basically allows you to it basically um, scrapes Kickstarter for backer data when they go to that website. They basically put in their Kickstarter ID um, and it it pulls up their information, kind of links that to a unique you know, a thing in their database and provides them with a specific referral link that they can share. And when they, if, if anyone backs your project uh, as a result of that referral link, they get some sort of reward. So other campaigns I've seen, they've done that with uh, free shipping or they've done it with an extra copy of the game. What we decided to do is uh, enamel pins, like collector pins for anyone who has done that. Um, and, you know, for, for the people who care about pins, that's, that was definitely an incentive for people who don't, Obviously, they could care less about that. They're like, well, yeah, all right, whatever. Thanks, uh, no, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so, you know, that's part of the issue too. Is that you know, coming up with a referral reward that's not going to break you. You know, that's not going to cost you more money than it's worth. And also, that is something that people are going to be you know excited about and engaged uh, to do. So, you know, we're still figuring that out. Um, you know, we've always, you know, in our updates, we typically say, hey, don't don't forget to to uh, ask someone else to re to um, back the project. And usually the incentive that, that we talk about, you know, we don't do individual prize incentives, but what we do is just, hey, we want you guys to be able to make sure that you can get to those stretch goals mm -hmm. and telling people that the more backers, you know, the, the, the higher the number, the more stretch goals we're going to unlock. And that seems like that, that kind of group um, project is actually almost even better than individual incentives. Um, you know, not for everybody. Some people, you know, are thinking, well, other people can do that. And if we get it, great. Uh, I'm not going to go to the work of posting it here because, you know, I've got other things to do. Uh, but some people, you know, I, I've seen people posting their little referral links for this last uh, Kickstarter project, um, all sorts of places because they really want those pins. And, uh, you know, they would. That they, is so cool. So the, the yeah. name of that is kickrock.it, was it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's similar to like uh, Kick Booster, also, right? I, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so kickrock.it, we'll have to do some research on that. Um, that's a really good tip. And that's, that's like another way to just gamify this entire experience and make it feel like you're leading towards this unlock stretch goal. And you're also having your friends participate in it. It's really kind of a, a neat um, system way that you, you do that. Um, so I have one, one more question for you here. 
Um, I really, I think we could spend a lot more time with you because you've like obviously done a lot of different projects and a lot of different campaigns. You probably have way more lessons that you've learned on like the shipping front and all this kind of stuff. So we might have to do another show. Um, but the, the one question I want to ask you is, you know, so your most recent campaign, um, you know, it's done incredible. Um, you know, I imagine people can go now and check this out on your website. Um, uh-huh. What other stuff do you have in the works? Like, are you coming out with a, with a new game or something? Where can people learn more about you? Yeah, so I mean, we have our, our website, BezzyaGames.com, um, which have pretty much all the games that, that we publish that are still in print, uh, both the social deduction games as well as our regular strategy games. Uh, we will be using um, um, Kickstarter in the near future. We actually did, I think, three campaigns this year, which is a prior record for us um, on, on different things. And, and they all did uh, fairly well, which is, which is great. Um, but we we have uh, we're going to do our next one is going to be for a collector's edition of one of our most popular um, strategy games, which is called Suburbia, and that's a game that we released about know, six years ago, um, and it's it's been pretty consistently in the Board Game Geek top 100, and uh, you know it continues to sell fairly well. But uh, we're going to be we're doing a very special edition that's a collector's edition, and we're going to make some things that are only available to uh, Kickstarter backers. And, uh, you know, as if you if you back it on Kickstarter and I think uh, people are going to be very excited. We're kind of going all out with it. And it's kind of the super deluxified version of the game. Very cool. So for those listening, it's uh, B-E-Z-I-E-R games dot com. You can learn more about some of the, the games that they have in the works there and also some of the other campaigns, some of the other board games that they have out. Um, well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show, sharing like all this great info. This is a lot that I also just have to process. And I think a lot of the listeners have to sort of take in and, um, going forward, they can apply that to their projects. My final question for you is, you know, five years ago, you, you made that decision to go full time. What would you have said to yourself when you were just, um, beginning that sort of journey? Would you be like a word of encouragement? Could be a final tip that you want to leave with the listeners, anything like that. Um, would love it. I, I can give you the floor. Yeah. Here. I mean, I think for, for us and the thing that we have done and that I think that was really important that we did was, you know, we are making as much as you want to make the games for yourself and be happy with what you're doing. You need to listen to your your customers and your potential customers and make sure that what you're creating is something that they're interested in. And, you know, if you need to make sure you, you kill the things that aren't getting the response that you're hoping for and not try to don't, don't ignore any of those negative things. Take it to heart. See if you can address any of those issues and put out the best possible product that's really going to appeal to as many people as possible that they're going to really enjoy and and love. And that's that's a great way to pretty much ensure that you're going to have um, you know continuing success. Awesome, Ted. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and we'll have to have you back. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Sal. Hope you've had a chance to dive into some of the other episodes that I have out there because, man, they are killer. Like, lots of great episodes, um, lots of different types of products. You know, I really try to have on, like, a breadth of different types of campaigns. So things like board games, things like publishing campaigns, things like um, technology gadgets and gizmos. My, my goal here is that um, in going through my archives, you'll actually see someone or you'll come across a campaign or an entrepreneur who you resonate with. And I think that whenever we see someone being successful who is similar to us, maybe comes from a similar background, or at least has a, a type of product that we're also trying to make, it kind of makes us more confident. You know, just, just being plain honest here, I think it makes you more confident that you can actually pull off this launch, that you can also raise money. And that's been my goal from the get-go. Like, not only do I want to share valuable education with you, advice, tips, and strategy, But I also want you to see by listening to the stories of these different entrepreneurs, how you can also do the same thing. There is nothing stopping you from making that decision. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. Um, There's a lot of uncertainty. It it can be really hard, particularly in the early days, to actually set up your own business. But as you heard today, that little micro decision can make a world of difference. It can mean you actually doing work that you're passionate about, um, doing work from the comfort of your home in, this, in his case, having employees that are working for you, being able to, to do this business with your spouse, being able to actually put out products into the world that you're passionate about. And, you know, like he was saying, there's not really that much security anymore when it comes to traditional jobs and traditional nine to five kind of corporate gigs. It's really sad. But I think that at the end of the day, my core takeaway, my core lesson 
from listening to, to today's entrepreneur was that you always just have to be all in on yourself. You have to be all in on your skills and your abilities. And you have to be the one to say, yes, this is something that I want to go after. And you have to do it with as much passion as you can, all of the energy, all of the spirit, all of the hustle, because it can really pay off in the future. So guys, if you want to receive advice, tips, strategies, and also learn a little bit more about my life, you know, bite-sized stories that I share with you, things that are happening in my life, and also just a bit of encouragement, a bit of encouragement as you're going after and trying to launch this campaign on Kickstarter, um, you can join my weekly newsletter, Killer Crowdfunding Tips. And on this newsletter, I share with you some of my, my new blog posts, some new YouTube videos, new podcasts, new stuff in the works that I have coming out. Um, you can learn about that at this link, crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash subscribe. You just have to go to that link. Um, you'll be asked to give your email address and then you'll pretty much just receive personal emails from me. If you want to, you can reply to any of those emails. Um, I do read every single person that replies, but I'm not always able to actually reply myself because obviously I have a lot of stuff going on. I have a business, etc. but I do read every single message. So thank you so much if you decide to do that. And also the only way that I know that you like this show, the only way that I know that this was helpful for you and I can put out more like this is if you leave a review on iTunes and I can see that visually. Um, so I'd also also appreciate it if you could do that if you're on your smartphone right now um, just leaving a review on itunes would mean so much thank you for joining me today and i'll see you next time <laughs>